Hello and welcome back to Friday Night Bites. Hey, I'm Jordan. yours truly, <laughs> Jordan Darling, with Scott Rizdahl, as always. Scott, good to see you. Back again. Back, back again. again. Talking food and and security topics in that order. Yeah. What are we talking about today, huh? Today we want to talk about supply chain attacks. Supply um, chain attacks. Why? Yeah. Why would we want to talk about that? Well, we've been on kind of a, a ransomware uh, bent here for a few weeks, and so we thought we'd, you know, try something new and look at a slightly different kind of uh, cyber attack that has been in the news very recently. Um, we have a great case study to share today that's basically still in progress. So um, we're yeah. going to get back to that once we've talked about fried chicken. See, we are fresh. <laughs> we are fresh on the scene, if you know what I mean. But also a little bit deep fried. <laughs> oh, man. Deep fried. Speaking of deep fried, can I tell yeah. you about something? Please do. I want to I want to talk about some food because that's what we do here. You know, Friday night bites. We talk about the bites with an I before the bites with the Y. And this is just local places that we think uh, that we enjoy that we think everyone ought to try out. And um, that's right. Scott, I have two words for you. Hit me. <laughs> Brasa rotisserie chicken. Uh, it looks like you forgot the word premium. So that's four Brasa words. Brasa premium rotisserie chicken. Brasa. Brasa, which means fire or ember or coal, char broiled. Okay. This is how this is how they do it. I have um, been to Brasa, but tell me about Brasa. Yeah, so it's a wonderful place, my friend. Um, and now I have I haven't been there recently, but it is a place that my wife and I frequent. So it, it was it was a, a a must go back. It's a place that we often uh, suggest if we have people visiting and we think that we want to impress them a little bit. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so they do they do like American Creole cooking. So what's Creole? Uh, I think like uh, New Orleans. Um... You know, beans and rice, uh, yeah, fried chicken, maybe some collard greens or something like that mixed in. Yep, yep, you're exactly right. It's and and you know the way they put it, it's it's food that's inspired by Southern U.S., Caribbean, Mexico. I think Creole, uh, you know, kind of stems from you know Spanish, French, and stuff. So, uh, so that's kind of the heart and soul of it, and and and. You know they have some nice, tender, juicy, flavorful rotisserie chicken, um, and it's delicious. And they don't just have chicken. I mean, they have pork too. They have catfish, you know, and options like that. Uh, <clears throat> but also they have uh, some interesting sides too. You know, like like you like southern sides, like you would think of, like like fried sweet plantains. That was delicious. We had those. We loved those. Spicy creamed spinach with jalapeno and crema. It was <laughs> delicious. Grits, cornbread, you know, very oh, good man. stuff. And and, yeah. and the and the atmosphere too. Uh, <clears throat> this is the last thing I'll say about it. the atmosphere was pretty unique. Um, at least the one we went to. I, I don't know if this is all of them. Um, I I don't know. I guess I haven't been to all of them. There's like three of them in the Twin Cities, but um. The one we went to was built out of a garage, mm. and, I, and I don't remember. I don't remember the story. For some reason, in my head, I'm thinking it was like an old uh, firehouse or something, but I can't remember. Is that the one on um, like Hennepin in Northeast? Right, right. I was the Northeast one. That's the one I've been to. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it was, it's, got, it was a, it's got a nice feel. I remember that. Yeah, it was a cool atmosphere. You know, we've been there twice. We've been there in the summer, so then there's like outside seating, and that's really cool and nice and. And, um, you know, we've also been there in colder times where we're inside the garage and, and, uh, it's a fun time. Cool. I just pulled the, uh, that location up on the, on the screen here and it's very clearly a garage. Very clear. Yeah. 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 Cool. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to see your Minnesota Southern fried chicken and <gasps> I guess call, not raise you another, <laughs> another fine Minnesota fried chicken restaurant called revival. Um, mm. Revival is very similar to what you just described. They um, pride themselves on their chicken. They have uh, 
um, a nice range of kind of sauces or, or uh, finishings or whatever you want to call them. Everything from your plain Jane, sort of KFC style, you know, crispy fried chicken, all the way up to some of their more spicy and, and intense um, sauces. So let me take us on a quick tour here. Oh, not cater. Um, where are the menus? So I've been to the one in St. Paul the most. It's right on Selby? No. Okay. Where is it? Somewhere over there, kind of by the cathedral, right? Um, yeah, yeah. That's, that's where I proposed to my wife. Around there. At the cathedral? Well, no, like... Uh, at the at fried like, chicken uh, place. Winter, Winter Park, the Rice Park, or whatever. Or like Selby Park. Yeah. yeah, I like it over there. I was just down at Nina's the other week meeting with a business associate. And uh, just a nice atmosphere. It feels like a different town than the rest of St. Paul, but I digress. Um, revival, yeah. So they, like you said, they have fried chicken. Um, they have chicken and waffles. They have shrimp and grits. Um, you can get a whole chicken if you want one. They also have uh, a few peripheral things. If you're not in the chicken mood, they've got a burger. They've got a patty melt. Um, really good sides. Collard greens, cheddar grits, cornbread, hush puppies. Does uh, Barasa have hush puppies? Poultry geist. <laughs> yeah, is that the hot sauce? The hot hot sauce? <laughs> Something, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's really good. So if you're going to try Brasa, I would encourage you to also try Revival. And they do have... Yes, yeah, so I've never had Revival, but you've had both. And so do, do you, what's your, which one takes the cake for you? Whichever one I find myself at. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, they're, they're, honestly, they're both really good. They've both been around, I think, about the same amount of time, maybe like six, eight years. Not a huge amount of time, but, you know, COVID was in there, so um, yeah. they weren't open for a long time. But um I've been to Revival more, but mostly just because it's closer to my neck of the woods. So yeah, I tell you, they 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 uh, Revival definitely has a lot kind of a lot more big a bigger menu, brisket yeah. and all these things, burnt yep. ends. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. So there you go. Two options. Cool. So if you're in the mood for some chicken, and you're in Minnesota, we've got you covered. Yeah. All right. Main attack. Um, yes. Yes. Jordan, the main course today is supply chain attacks. Some deep fried software. Yes. <laughs> um, so what supply, is chain? A supply chain attack. What is a supply chain? How? How? So I during COVID and after COVID, we we've heard about like supply chain issues. I'm not sure if there's a better term for it than that. But like, you know, everyone was on lockdown for a year and a half or whatever it was, and so you know, the things that people made in other parts of the world, let's say, um, that eventually make their way into the things that are made here or consumed here, um, there was a big delay, right? There were people right. hunkered down in China and Mexico and the United States too. Um, and people who work in factories were just not turning out parts that, yeah, that people stuck on making. boats or something. I, well, I don't, I, I yeah, don't that's right. I remember seeing a picture of like the LA Harbor and there were just like so many container ships just like waiting. Um, so yeah, yeah like so you supply chain. Laptop and your laptop is sitting there right on the dock of the bay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so the supply chain is just the chain of things that supply vendors and and uh, retailers and stuff who eventually want to give you a product that has more than one part in it i suppose um, yeah so a supply chain attack then is somehow attacking that progression of of production and incorporation and consumption right right and and there's there's kind of so it's basically attacking someone who's a part of you know a third party vendor to what you deliver and then they kind of use they 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 get in there to then wager the attack on you and then your clients or whatever. So, it, you know, there might be like different flavors of it depending on what the motives are. But like, like for instance, like um, <clears throat> uh, in the CrowdStrike article uh, talking about kind of what supply chain attacks are, they, they mentioned like the target breach, you know, that that was, yep. you know, of all like kind of like what seems in my mind is like the thing that started it all, the, that started all of the, constant bar barrage of incidents and stuff it seems to all go back to target for some reason and yeah and so that you know they talk about that as a supply chain attack because 
they actually compromised the HVAC vendor, you know, so it was, you know, to actually then then right. use that to attack target and compromise. Right. The HVAC vendor was kind of like a, a backdoor, literally, I guess, you know, if you think of, of a target building and all the security is kind of at the front, you know, where where um, there's there's cameras everywhere, but, you know, the, the focus is on the front where the people come and go. Um, the HVAC people probably don't use that entrance, right? There's a, there's a side door, there's a back door where um, they would access the HVAC gear for a given target store location, right? And right. so it, it didn't necessarily happen that way physically, as far as I know, but, but the analogy holds. It was, it was a, a, the point of, you know, the point of weakness that got into the castle was this non-target entity. Yeah, and so then when you think about it from software supply chain attacks, which is what we're going to be dissecting today a bit, um, so that's when when they inject malicious code into an application um, in order to infect the users of the app. So uh, because software gets put together, it's it's from multiple different things there's there's third parties and different codes involved in where they they kind of source that from mm -hmm. and um and so so if they can infect a piece of that software uh without you knowing like you can put it i guess the the, the, the thing that <clears throat> as we were kind of talking about this the thing that sticks out is of uh, as far as the, the risk is that this is software that has been marked as approved by the vendor, the, right. the, the ultimate vendor who's delivering the application to the users. The and product, even though yeah. there's multiple pieces of it, uh, one of those pieces gets compromised. And if they don't detect that, then they just kind of say, all right, here's the update to your software. It's pr approved. And, you know, it already kind of has um trust right yeah sometimes in, implicit and sometimes explicit trust so implicit trust would be hey i downloaded this from the website of whoever right i, I got it from the source that, therefore i trust it it's not from some sketchy you know freeware site or whatever um but i would say explicit trust is also similar but different and that's when um you know a vendor cryptographically signs their executable signs their program um to, to be able to prove, you know, mathematically, right, that that it did indeed come from them, that their developers are the ones who built that executable um, and then delivered it to you. And that's kind of like the ultimate stamp of software trust is, you know, right. Microsoft says <laughs> this Microsoft software engineers built this thing and delivered it to you. Um, and that's verifiable. And so, yeah, if, if that stamp of approval is on a piece of software, like, what else would you look to for trust? behaviors i think we'll touch on that uh we'll touch on that when we examine this is we will uh, yeah and 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 so here's here's a couple a couple stats that i found it's interesting from that uh, crowdstrike article there um mm -hmm. <laughs> the average software project has 203 dependencies so if a popular app includes one compromised dependency every business that downloads uh from that vendor is compromised as well uh so and, and you might um, I, correct me if I'm wrong here, because I mean, development isn't my my strong suit, but um, like there can be there there can be code or 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 packages of software that are used by multiple multiple vendors. So like it, like for instance, we're going to be talking about three CX today, voice over IP uh, provider, <clears throat> and. Uh, and so this isn't, I don't know if this is true, but this is just kind of an example for like, there could be another voice over IP provider who in their app uses the same code or at least a piece of the same code in their software yep. that came from the source, source from the same place that was also compromised. Yeah. Is that, is that, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, it depends on the software and the components involved, but yeah, if there's a, you know, if there's a upstream, as they say, if there's an upstream dependency that is used by multiple products, you know, downstream, then compromising one could compromise all of them. 
Um, the biggest name in supply chain attacks is arguably SolarWinds, right? Right. Um, a couple of years ago. And um, you know, I forget exactly which component, if it was a dependency of theirs or if it was their own code that was hacked. But, you know, every other company under the sun uses SolarWinds, so pun intended. And, uh, and so, yeah, it finds its way into a whole bunch of shops, even though the compromise only took place, you know, sort of in one location right yeah and what's what's interesting i i can't help but kind of entertain the idea that again that's that's maybe a strategy from a criminal where it's like some of some of those entry points might be lower fruit easier to compromise like you're, you're compromising this piece um and now you just so it's almost like now you just maximized or like exponentially increased your possible footprint and damage yep. but you went for the lowest hanging fruit you didn't go after this the company directly right you, know? you didn't go after target you went after bobby joe's you know 24 7 hvac service right mm -hmm. uh, a couple other stats i i called out uh, on the, in that article too is um only 36 percent uh of companies have vetted all new and existing suppliers for security purposes in the last 12 months. <clears throat> so, so we're going to talk about that because I do, I want, I kind of want that to be the punch home at the end is vetting, you know, vetting uh, your vendors. Sure. Um, but it, it, not many people do it according to this study. Yeah. And the way that's um, phrased real quick, that's not saying vetted the code that they took or licensed from other companies. That's just sort of saying, did their due diligence to even understand if vendor A has a security program, right? Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and also 59% uh, of organizations that suffered their first software supply chain attack did not have a response strategy. So that's kind of another point that we often make on this show is yep. the response stra strategy. And, and we're going to see some specific examples of how that plays out with our case study today. Yes. What is that case study? For those oh, who boy. haven't heard, heard this recently. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's the 411 on uh, this supply chain attack? <laughs> we're going to keep the VoIP puns going all night long. Um, so... Uh, you and I both kind of texted back and forth about this as it was happening. Um, we've both worked with this company and this product before. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> they're a big player. I actually didn't realize until reading all these articles for the show here that like they're the VoIP company for Coca-Cola, right? Right. Um, BMW, like some pretty big companies. Um, I had always assumed they were sort of like a small, medium business. Um, and maybe that's their, you know, that's the bulk of their uh, customer base, but they've got some really big fortune, whatever companies, customers. Right. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah, like 12 million, 12 million users or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. <clears throat> um, so yeah, so the, the case study is three CX. Uh, I don't know what it stands for. Do you three CX? It stands for three C X. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for clarifying um P P pbx P yeah yeah i suppose maybe it's a sort of a playoff of pbx so they yeah. are they are a big VoIP company they produce software for windows mac os linux and mobile devices and they also have some web apps too um, that can run in your in your chrome type browsers i think um, mm -hmm. and so they provide both those clients for interacting with VoIP um, as well as the server software that that uh, you can either, you know, license from them and host in your own infrastructure, or I think they have a, a cloud offering too, right? So they're a they're a big full full blown uh, VoIP company. Yeah, great product. <clears throat> so I've heard. this is going to be uh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'm looking at this first Reddit thread here, and and I texted this to you whenever a week ago or something. Yeah. Um, and asked if yeah, you this is kind of how it came all all came out. Just all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the Reddit, the people on Reddit, and I think some Discord channels too were were chattering about this. And the way it all started, from what we've read, is that one or maybe a couple um, 
uh, higher end antivirus products, specifically um, Sentinel One, right? Um, started seeing some weird behavior from uh, the 3CX desktop app running on, I think it was Windows systems initially, but we learned later on that the Mac versions were also uh, affected, I think. Yep. Um, so they saw some weird behavior and they saw things like the th you know, uh, processes spawn from the 3CX desktop app beaconing out. So trying to connect out to um, you know, infrastructure servers and domains that it had no reason to, right? And um, again, we said this already, but let's emphasize this software was signed by 3CX. It was cryptographically signed by their developers. Um, if you opened it up in your on your computer, you could see right there. Here's the you know the certificate information for for how this can be verified, right? Um, so most anti most traditional antiviruses would have not batted an eye, right? They would have said this is obviously a, a legitimate product um, mm -hmm. delivered from the company. Look, you can look right here for the signature. Uh, go on and talk to whoever you need to talk to. Um, but Sentinel One, being kind of a, a higher end, you know, EDR as they say these days, um, a tool that looks at behavior and you know system performance and things in addition to just looking for known bad software, um, started to to produce some weird um, some weird signals and some alerts. I think from what I've read, there they were like not definitive, which um, some people complained about later on, specifically some of the people at 3CX, saying you know. Mm -hmm. It didn't say this is a supply chain attack. It didn't say this is a nation state actor trying to, you know, whatever. It just said something weird is going on. And so right. we get into this kind of this murky, weird situation where, you know, sure, antivirus products have false positive alerts, you know, all the time. So why make a big deal out of it? And that's kind of how it stayed for, I think, the first three, four, five, six days even. Um, yep. and, and we know now that that started around the 22nd of March. Yeah, the 29th. And, and, I mean, I'll, and I'll admit too, like <clears throat> we, much like a lot of IT service providers, uh, we use Sentinel One, and and we had those things pop up. We had those it, it flagging uh, 3CX, and and you know it was like it, you know. So I do have kind of some some compa compassion for 3CX a bit because it was it is kind of like okay, well, this must be a false positive. You know, and then this is just kind of to give insight into what's going on in the head. It's like, well, because right. we know it's a trusted app. Yep. And it's lagging it for some reason. It seems unclear. This must be a false positive. And so we would pr approve it. <clears throat> yeah. And and to that point, like, even if it wasn't cryptographically signed by 3CX, you know what your, your stack is, right? You know what legitimate software you put on your, your clients, your customers' computers. And, and oftentimes, you know, in order to avoid false positives, you'll, you'll whitelist or allow list, you know, whole directories right. of, of what you consider to be legitimate software. And this is where the nightmare of supply chain attacks really starts to become clear is, again, this is stuff that you trust. You, you put it there. <laughs> you put mm -hmm. it there. And it's updating itself, which is what you expect it to do. Um, and all of a sudden, one day in March, it's not quite the same software. <laughs> So um, Sentinel One and a little later on uh, Falcon CrowdStrike um, started detecting some weird stuff. And I'll just scroll through this first article a little bit here to get some of the early indicators. In this article, they call it the atomic indicators. And these were domains that, um, that the compromised software, uh, computers running the compromised software started beaconing out to. And I got kind of a laugh out of these because they, they actually did a pretty good job of trying to make them look legitimate. So, you mm -hmm. know, Akamai, container.com. There's no, there's no numbers in that URL. It doesn't look sketchy. It's not .ru. It looks like an Akamai address. Um, same with the second one. Then we're on to Azure. Azure Deploy Store. That sounds like Microsoft has, yeah, Microsoft has so many domains, I can't even keep track of all the legitimate ones. So right. Azure Online Cloud could easily be one of those. So again, if you're looking for, um, if you're looking at the alerts in Sentinel One and you say, oh, the software is trying to connect to Azure, you might just think that's okay, right? Yeah, PBX phone network. Yeah, of course it's trying to get to the PBX phone network. Yep. Yep, that's what it is. Why wouldn't it try to connect to that? <laughs> then there's some sketchy ones. SBMSA.wiki. I don't know what that is. Sourceslabs.com. Grammatically incorrect, but still looks legit. 
Visual Studio Factory. I mean, that could that sounds like a Microsoft site. And then poor poor Zachary's <laughs> blogs. <laughs> I hope that wasn't a real blog site, but now I kind of want to go look for it. <laughs> so, so the, they observed carried? some of this beaconing, and they also found a few distinct file hashes for the um, versions of the software that was backdoored here. So you can see, ultimately, I think it was announced that there were two specific versions that were compromised, and then both on Windows and Mac. So... There you go. So already on what is this, the 29th ish? Um, there's there's some understanding that something major is going on, and they posted some resources, and then they kind of kept updating this, and then there were a whole bunch of people saying, "What the heck is going on?" Which is all that Reddit is really good for, anyway, right? Then the next day. <laughs> There is another post on the uh, RMSP, so the Managed Service Provider subreddit here. The title is simply, 3CX likely compromised, take action. And it's it's a link to some of the, the CrowdStrike info that we already looked at. And then it's a whole bunch of people, again, trying to figure out what the heck is going on. I, I, I thought it was interesting uh, right there at the beginning where it says uh, they suspect the same group that did want to cry. People probably remember that. And so they're kind of saying, that it, once they realize that this has been found out, they might go for mass destruction kind of a thing, mass right. disruption. Yep. Could be a, a wiper malware like WannaCry ended up being. Um, could do a lot of damage. And then people started sharing crowdsource scripts on how to uninstall 3CX desktop apps because I think at this point there was still very little response from the company. And that's something... Right. We're going to Crickets, get into a little yeah. bit more here. Yep. Um, so yeah, lots of uncertainty in the the customers of 3CX community. So then, a day later or so, we get our first um, forum post from Mr. Nick Galia. That's how you say it. He is the mm -hmm. CEO of 3CX. Um, he's a bit of a polarizing figure. I learned from reading a lot of these threads and Reddit comments. Um, apparently, he's made some divisive comments in the past about uh, about uh, their customers and those sorts of things. So I think, you know, unfortunately, in this situation, I think there was already sort of a, a trust deficit a little bit among some people in the community. Um, and they were ready to jump all over him as soon as he didn't say anything for a while. And then eventually when he did, too. Yeah, you got to love Reddit where they say... Uh... CEO finally speaks after an unacceptably long time. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. And you know what? This guy, I, you know, I got to give him credit. He, it, it didn't happen soon enough. It sounds like a whole week went by between the first maybe reports to 3CX by Sentinel-1 or Sentinel-1 customers um, yeah. and this post. So it, there was a gap. And then he jumps right in and he says, as many of you have noticed, the 3CX desktop app has malware in it, <laughs> which is just like the most deadpan way to open a conversation with your customers about something that potentially really negatively affects them. Right. Um, he he kind of keeps that tone throughout, which maybe it's maybe I'm reading into it wrong, but he just seems to be so matter of fact about it. And I think it rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. So anyway, his advice was um, he gives some specifics about, about what was actually compromised. And I think these turned out to be pretty true. So um, they have a few different versions of their desktop client. The one that was compromised is what they call the Electron client, which I think is like a, a UI development framework for mm -hmm. building for building applications. Um, and uh, and so he he tries to sort of pin it on that a little bit, and then he starts giving people um, starts giving people alternatives. So um, you know we have these other applications that you can use to access your 3CX services. One is called the PWA client, which is like a web-based client for the, the application that I've used before too. Um, and he says, yeah, it's almost the same thing. And uh, it doesn't have BLF functionality maybe, um, but you know, it's better than it's better than ransomware. <laughs> right, right. And I don't know, I, I, I kind of like his communication. Like, uh, I, I mean, you know, I'm not gonna let him off the hook completely or anything, but like, but I do, I do have respect for someone just not wasting a lot of fluff and just giving, getting to the point. 
even if he's going to take criticism for it, you know, because because sure. the, the thing that I can spot is that, you know, PR talk, you know, like a lot of words to try to, you know, flavor it up. And it's almost like, just get to the point. Yeah, this is this is a problem. Here's some solutions. Boom, boom, boom. Like, I can respect that. Yeah, that's a good point. I, to argue the other side a little bit, in this sp specific case, because there was already reporting and, you know, comments online about it being a supply chain attack, um, you know, as a customer, as a user, my instinct is to say the whole company's compromised, right? If, if something got delivered with that was signed, if a signed executable got delivered through their supply chain, through their software delivery methods, um, and, and it was full of malware, like what in their company can we trust? You know, they, they, mm. they might not know that the whole company is, is owned. Um, and so I think you see a lot of that sort of tension and uncertainty in the comments here um, yeah. for good reason, because they just didn't know the scope yet. Nobody knew the scope, really. And, and you hear it over and over in these things. People want immediate response they do they, they don't they, want to have to sit in silence on this yep and and here's some comments um this one was same day march 30th uh it just says supply chain risk is really very challenging <laughs> right and, but then it says you know too bad for this incident but it could it could happen to anybody glad the ceo stood up and acknowledged so this person's on your side they're saying you know it is a sticky it is a challenging situation and especially at this point in time all the answers weren't known. And so, you know, let the guy, let them work, let them figure out what happened. Um, and they, and they did. And, and he actually, the CEO and the CISO were both pretty involved in the comments for the coming days. This, this particular thread goes on for 14 pages. We won't scroll through it all. Um, the next update I just want to jump to quickly is it's time stamped on the same day. Um, I guess it was a little later on, but it's again, Mr. Nick saying, um, uh, just an update to say that Mandiant, the probably most well-known incident response company out there, um, has been appointed to investigate. So when you when you are hacked, and especially if you don't really know what's going on, and maybe your internal security controls failed in a way that you don't understand, yeah, you call Mandiant, you know? Mm -hmm. We joked on a previous episode about, you know, where's Batman? Um, where's Bat How do you call Batman when there's a cyber incident? Well, Mandiant is, I think, pretty much Batman. Since. They're Batman? They're Batman. So uh, then uh, another day goes by, and Mr. Nick posts uh, the first of a, of a few um, blog posts on the 3CX website. And this one is, again, pretty, like you say, minimal fluff, straightforward. We regret to inform you that our company has become the victim of an attack and our product on the larger supply chain. Our highest priority is to be transparent in sharing details, and on and on he goes. Um, so he, one thing I want to point out, and I, you know, again, it's not about shaming, but nowhere in here, in his official language, have I seen a mention of anything before the 29th of March. Um, so there was a whole week when we know some people at 3CX knew that something fishy was going on. Um, and so he sort of sets the, you know, sets the base of the incident at the 29th, but there's a, there's a whole lot of untold story that we may never learn about from the previous seven days. Um, and as actually, as we'll see near the end of the episode, they think this happened maybe last year, even yeah. last, last summer. So there's a whole lot to the story that, you know, before March 29th, but, um, so real quick, he does give a couple bullet points. What is 3CX doing about this? Um, with Mandy and by our side, Batman is here. We're conducting a full investigation. This includes a thorough security review of the web client, the PWA app, and Mandy and engineers are validating the entire source code of our web app, blah, blah, blah. So they, you know, Batman's there. Um, they're getting the best help in the world. Um, and then what do they recommend doing? Get rid of the software for now. Just uninstall it as quickly as you can. Um, update your antivirus and EDRs and keep scanning until the cows come home. And then if you really still need to make phone calls, use the PWA app. So pretty, pretty concrete advice, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. And then he, he offers uh, three months free uh, subscriptions to 3CX uh, as a token of their apology. And, and I think I would, I'd also point out uh, the, what I think was interesting is that uh, the security community uh, also pitched in. 
You know, I thought it was interesting right away, even before 3CX had made a peep, uh, you had Huntress offering, you know, a free free 30 days, you know, for people to, to run Huntress on their environments that had 3CX. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. And and Huntress gets a lot of good kudos for, for being that way. I, I can't count the number of incidents like this where they have jumped in and said, yeah, okay. Um, and actually, I think the next article here is, yep, it's Huntress. Mm-hmm. Um, and just so for folks that maybe don't know, Huntress is essentially like software that's the monitoring, monitoring uh, behavior and, and there's people viewing it. So like there's actual people going through what's happening and making real actions when they see some behaviors that are weird. Yep. Yep. Um, so that's a good segue. Uh, should we do a little bit of a quick deep dive into the particulars of the attack as far as we know them? Yeah, yeah, quickly. Okay. Um, so yeah, so Huntress, they're um, you know, a managed security monitoring service. Um, they install a little tiny agent uh, application on each of the endpoints that they're watching. And then that just ships all the telemetry, all the system information back to Huntress HQ. And people are there 24-7, as far as I understand, um, to dig through it, like you said. So um, you know, they don't waste a lot of words. Uh, 3CX desktop app was compromised to deliver malware. Um, they've been investigating, and please see below for details. So they do a little bit of background research. They found 242,000-some-odd um, instances of exposed 3CX phone management systems connected to the Internet. That's scary. That's a lot. Yep, that is a lot. You always wonder why things are directly exposed to the Internet. never makes sense to me, but that's not what this episode is about. Um, they claim 3CX claims to have over 600,000 customers, and it goes without saying that this has the potential to be a massive supply chain attack. So um, they're not—they're no fluff either. They're jumping right into it and talking about—they're comparing it to SolarWinds and the Kaseya hacks mm-hmm. that both happened in the last few years. Um, they talk about how many of their own customers they've found with uh, the the vulnerable or the weaponized compromised apps. Um, and then they jump right into the analysis, analysis and investigation. So they they retread some of the same Reddit threads that we were just looking at. Here we go. So here's here's the play by play. So the 3CX download is available on the public 3CX website and includes malware. Installations already deployed will auto update and ultimately pull down the same compromised version. Um, the the actual backdoor components are apparently two DLL files and. If you don't know DLL files, they're sort of like um, modules that you can add into a running program. So, you know, let's say your program does a calculator. Maybe you have a DLL that does calculus, you know, for a really simple example. So you would load in this DLL to provide more functionality in the application. Um, so it's a, a portable way to, to um, add functionality to an application. So, um, so the main 3CX app appears to have... Um, downloaded these uh, compromised DLLs and they get run by the parent program and uh, they apparently use some encryption um, to hide the fact that they're a weaponized um, (laughs) supply chain component. Um, And then interestingly, the final payload, once those DLLs are loaded, waits for seven days until um, so it kind of goes dormant, which is pretty smart, you know. Um, apparently, it had been going on for a few months, so they had some time. Um, so it waits, and then it reaches out to GitHub, of all things, um, to to grab some command and control uh, contact points, and then they give a list of what all those are here. So those are those domains we looked at earlier that all seem yeah. to be mostly legitimate. So pretty interesting staging and um, and sort of you know multi-part. Um, you know, gradual execution. So that's pretty cool. Um, they do link to these two files on Virus Total, which I have pulled up here real quick. And there's some funny names, as there always are. Uh, Sam Scissors seems to be a name for this attack, which I hadn't heard before. And they also call it Trojan.3CX. <laughs> um, Sam Scissors, supply chain agent. <laughs> People get creative and they're free to do that. Um, so yeah, so these these are out there now, of course, and, and they're known. Um, the whole world knows about them. Uh, going on a little farther, 
they they dive into the code, they um, reverse engineer the code, and kind of dissect what it's doing. We won't spend too much time looking at this, but this article is great. We'll post it in the show notes. Um, and they also, which one is this? Oh, interesting. So one of the DLLs is also apparently signed by Microsoft, not by 3CX. Um, so there's multiple trusted signatures in play here. Um, yeah. So yeah, so grabs all that stuff, decrypts some of the stuff that it was sort of hiding, and then um, ultimately hangs out for a few days. And, you know, waits for further instructions, basically. Um, and so in a supply chain attack, and Hunter says this above, you know, a lot of the stuff that they can see and that they find is just sort of the, the, the pregame show, right? It's, it's what it took to get this software into place, but then you got to wonder, what are they really after? Are they going to do right. a ransomware? Are they going to do a wiper like, like WannaCry? Um, we don't know. Yeah, so then, let's see, are we doing the register article next or the, yeah, we're finishing with security week, right? Um, we are, yep. So next is the register. And so this one is a little newer. This is just from this past Monday, the third. Um, so this is now kind of a retrospective on how it came to be. Do you want to, do you want to give the blow by blow here? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> the, the thing that stuck out to me in this article was, you know, and you kind of touched on, on this uh, a, a little bit ago, but we do get a little bit of insight on what 3CX was thinking when they were being told that this, uh, this could be, you know, when Sentinel One reached out to him, um, because uh, he, because he actually, it says here in like this third paragraph that um, the CEO Nick Galea uh, emailed the register when he was asked. And, and so they didn't ignore the alerts. He said that they chose to double check on virus total. So, so Sentinel one said this, something weird's happening. They said, well, let's check virus total, uh, virus total for anyone who doesn't know is a, a website that kind of, you can, you can upload a, a potential malicious file and it'll check it across all these different antivirus, uh, companies to see if it's on the radar, uh, for them and um and he basically said virus total gave him the thumbs up that it was good and and and, and so they considered it a false positive and then they checked again a few days later and it was the same result so he's kind of saying you know we didn't ignore the alerts we we checked on it and it seemed like it was a false positive yep yep and, and as we just said you know nowadays uh or today uh these files are all over virus total and every single vendor except for a few, <laughs> um, has obviously identified that they're malicious. Um, it is a little concerning, and, and you know, I'll be the first to admit that I'm guilty of relying on VirusTotal for kind of that industry-wide review of a given piece of software, um, but that shouldn't be the end of your incident response situation. You know, if, sure. if you got a security product squawking, and I don't know what they use internally at 3CX, apparently not Sentinel-1, but... Um, if you got a security product squawking and it's about your software, you should probably, you know, you should probably get a couple interns on it at least, right? <laughs> Especially one as reputable as Sentinel One. I mean, this yeah. isn't just this isn't like Mac Panda McAfee. antivirus or whatever. Like... <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. It's you know, and, and it and it it wasn't a clear cut detection. We we gather um, from Mr. Galia here, but. Um, all the more reason to dig into it and put a couple people on it. And and maybe they get these all the time, and it really is, you know, alert fatigue, which happens to everybody, but they did drop the ball. Maybe for good reasons, but they dropped the ball. And, and you know, virus total, things not showing up there, you know, final, kind of final thought on that is that that just means not yet. Like, as you said, like, now it's all over there. Like, in a, in a day where there's zero days left and right, yep. we're like, yeah. No one knows about this yet. <laughs> this is new. This is behavior stuff. This isn't like signature. Like this is a like this is something that, of course, isn't going to be all over virus total. Right. Yep. 
And and I'll, I'll qualify that a little bit by saying virus total has more than one part. <laughs> There's the main page, which shows you either, you know, helpful or, or ambiguous information about what each security product thinks about the file that you uploaded, but there are other parts to it too. They'll tell you, um, there's a whole behavior section. I would say it even maps it out to the MITRE ATT&CK framework for you. So it's totally possible that these, that all this info wasn't yet here when Mr. Galea and his company looked, but like there's real good sandbox process information here. So don't just judge the book by its cover, you know, like use another sandbox, dive in and look at the network telemetry. And it, it's not always, a, it's not always a guarantee that you're going to find something clearly, but um, you know, there's, there's more tools in the box. So, so then, then we get a glimpse of possibly what this whole thing was about and who was behind it. Are we on to the security week? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the register kind of mentions it too, but it, it sounds like North Korea is up to no good again. It does. Let me jump to that article. So, um, so North Korea. Yep. Um, a little backstory here for people who don't follow cybercrime uh, closely. North Korea has had a pattern, especially in the last few years, of trying to find ways to steal cryptocurrency. Um, as you and I both know, North Korea is an isolated, uh, you know, Soviet-era dictatorship with uh, unstable leader. Um, no, I'm not talking about the United States from 2016 to 2020. Um, <clears throat> It, it's a country that, you know, basically they, um, they, there's not a lot going on there. There's, there's labor camps and a whole lot of hunger, I gather. Um, and kind of the whole place is run by one, one man's whims. Again, not the U.S. from 2016 to 2020. Um, so, so they, they need money. They, we have no they, political opinions on this No, show. no, I, I just all, all politics. Um, <laughs> so, but, but they, their hackers have been known to go after cryptocurrency. They've been known to just try to steal wallets, to hack into crypto exchanges, to try to take as much as they can. And as you hinted, this this case seems to be another one where they were maybe trying to find a way to to siphon off some crypto from, from some victims. victims. Yeah, yeah. So then, and this is this article is Kaspersky. Then that company has has been under the pressure in the past too. Yeah. Uh, being analyzed but they they did some of this research and and uh it looks like like uh north korea just to give you kind of a glimpse of what they're they're doing it says last year they stole between 630 million or more than a billion dollars worth of virtual assets yep yep and and for a country whose main exports are you know probably some kind of precious metals and um a few agrarian products like that's a lot of money and those are U.S. dollars. I can't imagine what that gets you in a country with virtually no economy. You know. Um, yeah. So yeah. So they they're they're into this. This is their this is their this is their payday. Um, and and this and this gives you that gives you a clue. Just kind of a sidestep. Like, so you know, again, we're not talking. So we're not talking a script kitty. You know, it's just some punk who, uh, you know. Uh, purchased a subscription to ransomware and is trying to operate an attack like like you start wondering like man this is a this is a nation state like you know targeted like they're like this is this is tough man right like this and and these are the same this is the same government that's shooting icbms over japan or whatever right into the south china sea just sort of because they want to because they feel like they need to rattle that saber to be taken seriously um, on the world stage. So, you know, it, it's not clear that they know their own limits or that they, they have a good sense for what those are. So also in the cyberspace, they're happy to, you know, to blow things up. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, going on, we learn, um, that they do need and use uh, cryptocurrency. Um, let's see what else was valuable in this last article. They didn't name the malware here, which I, which I guess is always good to do. Um, so they call it uh, Gopuram. Maybe that's a North Korean word. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, but yeah. So all I like the that, I like the term apple juice. Yeah, apple juice. Apple juice. 
that's a, di a different one, but yep. Um, and yeah, they and they do give that group a name, so it's it's you know it's all the rage to give these these groups names like Fancy Bear and whatnot. But so these guys are the Lazarus group, and they are linked to other previous high-profile cybercrime incidents too. So these guys are pros, is I think what we can take away from this. Um, one other thing from this article I thought was interesting is that it's still, you know, as of whatever this was, April 3rd or 4th, um, it's still unclear how they gained access to 3CX, right? So, right. Um, but it is believed to have started around the fall of 2022 or even the summer of 2022 um, based on the analysis of, of Kaspersky and, and uh, who else did they name here? Fortinet and BlackBerry. Um, so, you know, multiple security companies are, are sort of saying, yeah, this went on for a while, we think. Jeez. And, and you know, another another point before we kind of shift and, and wrap things up here. Um, I started thinking about the average guy, you know, because we're all about the average guy here. We start with food and we end with the average guy. That's our, <laughs> that's our story arc. Well, and I mean, I just kind of think, so this, it, we're talking about a supply chain attack. Um, the average guy uses software, right? So, um, you know, and, and this is like a reputable business software like was attacked, uh, mm -hmm. for this. Um, but the average guy, I start thinking about, you know, what kind of shady free software are you running? You know, what kind what, like <clears throat> if you're still running like a free antivirus, you know, like how much more vulnerable could that be to a supply chain attack? than a company that is, you know, actually has a security program and is trying to, you know, be reputable in the marketplace, you know. Yeah, that's a good point. And I know we talked in a previous episode about how, you know, there are some threats that the little guy doesn't, the everyday guy doesn't really have to worry about because they're more characteristic of people who go after big companies for big payouts. But I would agree with you that that this sort of thing or some version of this supply chain type attack is is super common, you know. And if you work in security long enough, you, you get to know these acronyms like PUP, right? And PUA, potentially unwanted programs or potentially unwanted applications. Those are basically supply chain attacks, you know, mm -hmm. whether or not the, the vendor of the ultimate software put them there on purpose for, for monetary gain is kind of beside the point. But you, you mean like when you install Adobe and you get some sort of free uh, other software that you didn't even realize? Yeah, sometimes it's McAfee antivirus. <laughs> <laughs> It, but exactly, you know, so like the, the everyday, the everyday Joe does have to worry about this because it's the wild west out there. And even signed software can carry unexpected Trojanized payloads. So, um, so what's the takeaway from all this? The takeaway is that supply chain attacks are really common at some scale. Ones like this, not so common, but um, the backdooring of software for data collection, advertising, all that stuff, super common, probably the most common type of malware out there, I would I would hazard to guess. You know, the, you call it what you want, adware, spyware, grayware, um, it's it's everywhere. And so- um, Where? <laughs> where, where. So the takeaway is that it's hard to avoid this stuff. Supply chain attacks are really difficult, even for paying customers with good security programs to, to avoid. And I suppose my takeaway would be don't just trust software because of where you got it or because it's signed by a company. Um, as a blue teamer, you got to know how to look for other, you know, indicators of compromise um, or, or, you know, behavior based things that, that don't just scream, this is a virus. You got to start looking into those gray areas between legitimate software and, and obviously, you know, ransomware. Yeah. Yeah, and to to me to me this shouts third party risk. Un understanding your third party risk, and you know maybe that's not an everyday guy kind of a term, but that is certainly a business thing to consider. And and I mean, so I mean I'm, I even we're not going to go into this, but like I just saw an article that Uber just got an, had another incident too, and it's a it's a it's a third party risk. They're 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 uh, lawyers, their law firm that they use got compromised which wow. then compromised their driver's security social security numbers and sensitive data <clears throat> and so 
so third party risk understanding your third par party risk and i think the, the 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 thing that i would touch on we obviously have to wrap up here but um but it's a real thing if you're not doing any kind of third party risk assessing um then you're leaving yourself pretty wide open and and it doesn't take much you know i i'm i'm a firm believer that um something is better than no thing like uh, so you don't have to necessarily tomorrow have this huge third party risk uh, program, but something is better than no thing. So <clears throat> and uh, and what I would leave people with is, you know, maybe start with when you're thinking third party risk, start with just um, an inventory of of what you have, like what what vendors do you have that you that and what kind of access do they have <clears throat> like. There's, there's the idea when you're doing a third-party risk assessment, there's the idea of inherent risk and residual risk. And inherent risk is just doing the due diligence real real quick uh, on the impact, you know, what, what kind of reach that vendor has with you. And, and, and then classify it. Is this a high-risk vendor or a medium-risk or a low-risk? You know, just it can be super simple. Sure. But, but certainly, like, understanding what kind of impact that that just comes with doing business with that vendor if they're a low risk vendor you might not have to do anything you know don't you, no, there's not a whole lot of risk there high risk maybe ask them a few questions maybe put together 10 bullet points or more like like depending like something to understand what they're doing because their security will impact your security um, and that's kind of where I'll leave you. And the residual risk is the idea of what's left over after that. So you've you've done your due diligence. You've you've assessed how they do security. What's left over? What holes are still there? No, now knowing how they approach security. That's that's a good takeaway. And like you say, it doesn't have to be complicated or expensive or whatever to start. You can just start with a questionnaire. You can make sure that every time you go out and, and you know buy a new piece of software or sign up for a new cloud service or whatever. Um, just have them fill out the questionnaire. Help them fill out the questionnaire, and then at least, like you say, you start putting some, some, uh, you know, some orders around the risk that you have by working with those people. So that's really good advice. On that note, I think I'm going to go have some fried chicken. <laughs> I'm going to have some fried chicken for sure. Thanks for hanging out with us tonight, everyone. We'll see you next time on Friday Night Bites. Peace out. Peace.